So welcome to my session with at v in my at v5 in mind to be specific. My name's Nick Callen, and I actually I just I don't live here in Denmark. I live in Sweden, but I took the train over, so I had fairly close ride. Uh, it's a little bit about me. I work as a consultant, primarily deploying applications using any type of platform. Uh, currently, I'm actually more invested in the legacy infrastructure of SCCM 2007, which is great and fun and provides many challenges. Previously, I've been heavily involved in Senap uh, in quite a few instances. Uh, I'm still involved, not as heavily, but still involved in some customers. Uh, working with IT for about seven, ten years, I think. So before we head on and talk about at v5, I usually start out getting a feel for the room. So if you want to raise your hands, if you use Citrix Streaming Profiler, okay. So you're suckers, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, I'm actually I was assisting a customer this week, uh, and it burnt my entire Monday Tuesday getting stuff working with it. It's really nice, it's really sweet, but it's end of life, and as far as I know, Citrix is recommending at v5 considering the integration with Send Desktop 7, right? Haven't looked at it, would be quite interesting to get a view on it. How many is using at v4.6? That's more hands. Last time I gave this presentation, or not this, but a similar presentation at a pub forum, not a whole lot of hands, actually. Uh, anybody using ThinApp? One guy, yeah. two guys, okay, you admit it now, <laughs> okay. Um, anybody using SCCM to manage their, regardless of version, managing their send app environment or send desktop environment? Couple of people, that's cool. So are you using the integration that Citrix are providing or your own stuff? Own stuff. Own stuff, okay. For Pretty now. For now, okay. Once the integration gets good enough, Okay, so at v5 is, I'll skip this one, at v5, there's lots of good stuff. Essentially, it's a brand new product. Yes, the fundamental concepts of application virtualization is still there, but there were lots of flaws in the previous version, and those have been targeted very specifically to be corrected. I'm not saying fixed, I'm not saying perfect, I'm saying corrected. Uh, essentially, there's brand new stuff in there. For example, we have automation for every part of the AppV components. We have fully automated sequencer, meaning we can create packages using PowerShell. PowerShell. You got it. You have been listening to the Microsoft uh, talk that have been giving the last few years. Exchange was first out, right? And now every other product is tagging along. Um, Next up is the virtual extensions. Virtual extensions are on the client side. Uh, actually, it begins at the sequencer, but the real improvement is on the client side. On the client side, you have more elaborate or more detailed um, uh, extensions into the operating system, allowing the application to behave just like a native application, meaning we can virtualize without losing functionality. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I'm saying corrected. They have a brand new format. Obviously, it is intended to be better, faster, and support the new extensions. But it's a, form, it's a new format, so we have to migrate to it. So meaning you cannot reuse your, uh, reuse your packages on the new infrastructure or on the new client. You will have to migrate, and this can be done through PowerShell, so yes, you can automate it. <clears throat> Next up is, of course, very, very hot topic for anybody using Senap. It's the shared content store. Previously, you had a uh, pretty horrible experience in managing uh, a way to reduce the storage impact you had on your infrastructure if having multiple Senap servers or multiple VDI instances, meaning multiple Windows 7 clients uh, running. Essentially, uh, the way it works right now is that you set up the client in a specific way, and that's it. No special actions, it's an install parameter, or you can even set it through group policy and you're done. Uh, the other topic that also is included in the improvement of application experience for the end user and increasing the possibility to virtualize applications are connection groups. Connection groups allows you to tie multiple packages into one. There was a I would say version one of this in at before 6 called Dynamics Recomposition. I personally had a Lots of struggle with it. It had a very intended focus area. Connection groups is much broader, and of course, it supports integration of applications in any way. Moving forward, virtual extensions. This is what we're talking about. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of screenshots to actually 
give you a sense of what I'm talking about here if you can't quite fully understand what they're about. Uh, shortcuts, essentially that's what on your desktop, not the start menu anymore if you're using Windows 8. Uh, it's the way we're used to starting an application uh, in a very specific uh, or a very simplistic way. Has been supported in AppView 4.6, not an improvement, still there. File type association. There's a major improvement in file type association. It has been supported in AppView 4.6. What we do get is not that icon. So on this system, I have the AppView 5 client. I also have the AppView 4.6 client installed. What I don't get, let's see if I can do this, is this little client here. So previously, if you wanted to interact with an application and alter the file type association, create a word package, perhaps you want to add a new file type to it, you would have to select this icon and then pick the word package. For a user who's not used to using AppV, this is of course a horrible experience. Now every application that's virtual, virtual, that's virtual, that's virtual, that's virtual, that's virtual. They're presented just like a native application. So the user experience is just like a native application. They will see no difference between a virtual application and a, what do you call it, natively installed, locally installed, physically installed, very physical. <clears throat> App paths. Um, I didn't know about this until a few years ago and I learned it by mistake. I think I can thank Helge Klein because I think he wrote a uh, blog article about it. Uh, essentially it's a way we can find executable files faster. There's a registry entry which points out where to look for it. Um, most commonly used on a Windows uh, 7 desktop is when you do the search and it's uh, quite easily presented. Hereby uh, you can see I've been searching for a specific executable file. I could search for the 7-zip file manager which is the shortcut on the start menu and I would find it. But if you search for the 7-zip executable, which is that one, you would not find it if you don't have the app path. Simple as that. Now this is natively integrated and deployed with the package onto the client, so any executable within the package can be searched for and executed if they have created an app path. That's usually decided by the developer, so not really something you would have to fix in the package, but something you get. <clears throat> URL protocols. This is kind of like a file type association, but instead of having, handling file types, we handle URLs and protocols. Samples are the call to, which for the link client, we have the more common ones, FTP, HTTP, HTTPS. This is, of course, native integrations with our browser that is installed natively. Anybody else who knows a couple of more, apart from what's on this list? I can name two, one Swedish company and one who is now owned by Microsoft, but used to be Swedish. Skype, Spotify, great, right? You want the protocol association because if you uh, search Spotify playlist, you click a link, you want it to open in Spotify, you don't want to download it and use the file type association instead. So again, improving the user experience. Um, apparently in Windows 8, there's a requirement that if you have a protocol extension, you register it on this node. And Windows 7, it's not there, so there's lots of software not complying to that part. So there's a protocol extension, but it's not visible here. Hopefully that gets better along the time as vendor or application developers get used to it. <clears throat> SPAD. I can't even re remember what that acronym stands for. Please help me. Uh, default programs, essentially. You can pick your default programs, meaning if I start a web browser, what is my web browser? Internet Explorer, Firefox, or Chrome. If you virtualize Chrome, how would the user tell the operating system, I want Chrome as my default web browser? Now it's natively, out of the box, supported for any package you have created. Improving the user experience again. This is the same for any mail application, so now you might actually want to virtualize Lotus Notes if you're still running that application. I know Andrew Morgan provided a very extensive blog article how bad it is in a Synapse environment. You could use it on the desktop with the native experience, both supporting mail to links and the default uh, uh, mail to, uh, default mail handler. You had a question? I would say it's uh, set program as default. Very good. <laughs> that was my question for that. No, um, I just forgot. Um, next up is the default media players. Default media players is about how, what should I do if I insert a media stick here, for example, a DVD, an audio record. What player should I uh, use to open that uh, as default? Um, for example, if you insert a movie, you get the Windows Media Player. If you have VLC Media Player, you can use VLC. If you virtualize VLC, obviously in a 4.6 world, the operating system did not know you had that one. Now, in v 5 without you doing anything, it will be available here on the list. Seems pretty good, right? 
<coughs> Next up, shared content store. It's a parameter if you install it. So basically, shared content store equals one, enabled. You can set it through group policy. You can check it by PowerShell, get app eClient config. <coughs> What does it mean? What happens? Essentially, you're running stuff off the network, and I think Helga Klein again, he's a really smart dude, isn't he? He said on Twitter, basically, you're running stuff off network. Yes, you are. App client will na uh, lay down uh, file pointers on the operating system, will not actually place anything onto the file system. It will register the applications. You get all the previous extensions I've just shown you. So you, the user can interact with the application just like it's used to, but the difference on disk is that the file is not its regular size, but a very small pointer. So you're not increasing the storage by duplicating an application on 50 Synapse servers or a thousand VDI desktops, basically. Uh, there's no difference in how you deploy applications. There's no difference in how you update applications. There's no different difference in how you reconfigure applications in any way. So this is from a manageability perspective, it's a no-brainer. What could impact, though, is, of course, if you have slow storage where the applications are running from, or if you have bad network. So SMB3, gigabit network, more than that, awesome. Meaning it's not a good idea on desktop. It's a very good idea in a highly low latency, uh, high bandwidth, low latency environment. Anybody using AppB5? Anybody using this, or are you running it on desktops? Uh, we're just starting to roll it out. Oh, okay. We're still figuring it out. Try it. It's just a switch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> Connection groups where two become one. Just like the Spice Girls. <laughs> I saw Neil Spelling, some thought of the UK, and everything I know about the UK started out in Spice Girls because my siblings played it a lot when I was a kid. Essentially, we combine two packages to create one common virtual environment. This is the picture Microsoft wanted to produce. They have a couple of other ones where they show where you connect in a box or something like that. Essentially, it's a priority, however. So you have one common virtual environment and you combine several packages. The, w the order that you list those packages will create that virtual environment. If you have a conflict in a registry key or a file, I think it's the top one wins, not the bottom one, but I just got a brain freeze, so we'll, you'll have to test it, basically. Essentially, it means that you can create a very complex environment with many applications. You can place a priority on connection groups, meaning if you have multiple connection groups with, with the fairly the same packages in them, you can have a priority and say, if the user has these in these connection groups, one of them will win, depending on what's available. SCCM does this great, the native infrastructure does not do it great, and you can of course, if you want to, do it manually by PowerShell. Um, connection groups is dynamic suite comp composition version 2.0, meaning all the things I whined about, to be honest, previously, has now been fixed. It looks pretty good, it's really awesome, and it's a bit tricky to handle in a standalone environment because it's all PowerShell based. I know Aaron Parker uh, made an improvement on the PowerShell modules and actually made it quite easily. And I think Tim Mangan, depending on what he said uh, last night or a few days back, that he will actually release a tool set to improve the process even more. SCCM makes it really easy. If you want to, I can bring it up later if there's time. <clears throat> so I've been saying all the stuff that's good. <coughs> Let's talk about the bad. Uh, what has been noticed is that, is that adding packages are slower. Uh, I know Ment van der Paas, if you saw his session on Biforum, probably mentioned this. He probably had some very good statistics on how much slower. Um, the publishing process, meaning where the server tells the client, yes, I have an app, and the uh, client actually gets it deployed onto the system, is longer. I would say compared to 20 seconds, if you have a couple of hundred applications previously in the old version, we're now talking to a minimum of a minute uh, for the same amount uh, of applications, essentially. That's a big difference. I don't know if they have a fix. I hope they do. I hope it improves over time, and I hope they certainly make it a lot faster in the future. If you're using SSM, you probably won't care about it. If you're used to the native infrastructure in the old version and want to migrate to the new version, yes, you will have a performance degradation from your perspective. Currently, it's per design. <clears throat> ACLs, where 
handled so easily in app before 6 but now it's actually inherited from the native operating system. Previously, there was a checkbox in the sequencer which said enforce security descriptors. What happened was that during the development of App v4.5, which was the first version uh, released purely by Microsoft, and they introduced that checkbox. They made it always checked, meaning we had pretty much the same uh, ACLs applied to the operating system or the file system of the package, and thereby we limited the user to writing in bad locations. Now we inherit that structure from the file system. That's a truth with a bit of mod modification and I'll talk a bit more about it later. But essentially if you have an ENI file in C program data you would need to edit the native file system, the ACLs on the native file systems on that root folder to actually get the user the ability to write to that specific file. That's really bad. <clears throat> So AppV5 is a re-architecture, we're doing something brand new, or we, Microsoft, uh, they're doing something brand new. 4.6 has matured over time, we've been whining about them, they had tons of customers using it, loads of applications have been gone, gone through the process of sequencing, the community has written tons of things, and I think Aaron Parker made a blog post that he had a list of about 400 recipes, so it's a quite mature process. AppV5, we're kind of starting over to a certain extent. It's not as mature. There are things that previously worked that is now a challenge. So it will have a maturity time before we are at the high level of virtualization without issues as that before 6, to be honest. However, you can do side-by-side -side deployment, meaning you can have applications not possible to sequence in a 5.0 environment on the 4.6 client because you can have both 4.6, Service Pack 2, and 5.0 client on the same machine, RDS server as, as desktop. So you can gradually migrate over your applications as the technology matures. And to benefit from the integration, I would certainly get 5.0 out and running. Um, to make modifications of a package we have already created, such as renaming a shortcut, uh, creating a new uh, virtual extension, which I showed earlier, adding a file, running a script, or anything like it, we have configuration files. <laughs> configuration files are generated as sample files during the sequence with pre-filled values that match up to your package. Sample files are great. They're really long. They're really humongous XML files, this big. Maybe this big. And it could be quite tricky to actually look at them the first time and get it running. I know Virtual Engine, which are not here. I think Nathan Sperry and Ian Brighton, I think his name. Yeah. Yep. They made a tool to actually simplify that once it's a graphical user interface. And just to get the syntax right, I would actually recommend using their tool. Their website is virtualengine.co.uk. You seem to know. Don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I think that's the website, and you can probably find it there. If you Google for a virtual engine, you will most likely find the website. I do recommend that their tool set for uh, updating the config files. That's the logo type. So if you find it, you know how it looks. Um, at v5, the ugly? I don't know. Um, Office 2013 requires at v5. There is no other way. You cannot do it with at v4.6. You don't have to sequence it. You just generate the package and you get it. There's no, I have to follow this 50 step process to get the package. It downloads the bits for you, generates the package on the fly. That's great, right? But you do need Office subscription though. So no, if you're a volume licensed customer today, you cannot get this. Office 2010 uh, is easier in App v5 compared to App v4.6. You get more integration with App, you get nicer integration with App v5 uh, than you did with 4.6. But essentially it's the same thing. You have to have a license engine running on the laptop. So the concepts that were introduced and 4.6 are applicable to the 5.0 version. I don't know, ugly, bad? Uh, anybody here talking to customers who are going to change their license model for Office to subscription? Where you go Office 365? Sure. Alright. Adobe's changing the model ent entirely, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Autodesk providing the same. I don't know if they're making that harsh switch though. But yeah, so subscription seems to be the way to go according to certain companies. Who's vendors? Vendors. <laughs> Not my company, I don't know. <clears throat> Native infrastructure, greatly improved, greatly enhanced. Four components, you have a database. You have a management server, which is in, uh, the admin interface to updating that database. The management server talks to that database. You have the publishing server. The publishing server talks to the management server, meaning the database can go down as long as the management server is up and running. The publi publishing server is fine. What happens next though, what happens if the management server goes down? It's all, uh, it's all okay because the publishing server will, every 15 minutes, cache down all the configuration we have. So the clients will not be impacted because you bring down the management server or the database. So it's very resilient in that manner. The publishing server is obviously what the client contacts and picks up a configuration file. It does not pick up the packages because those are streamed from either a simple web server or IIS web server to be very specific, uh, or a file share. So that file share should most likely be highly available or that web server should be highly available. All these components, apart from a file share and database, are just web servers so you can scale them out any way you like. Put a load balance in front of everything and scale out even more. You can have them on sites. That's great. If you want to have DFSR, replicate the data around to local sites, that's great as well. So scaling out, scaling up here is really easy. Um, I just checked if my mic was on. Um, what we also got was the long-awaited per computer per user publishing. A very common topic is, then, is that we only have per computer licensing. Now we have that. You can deploy to both per computer and per user. Way best management, it's silver light. Uh, okay, that's not... Hey, um, scaling out again, IS, SIFS, go for it, just knock yourself out. Highly available, I would only do it for the publishing server and the um, streaming component, meaning if that's a web server, scale out the web server or scale out the file server. Man management server is less critical, obviously if you have a very uh, high amount of publishing servers or you just want to have redundancy, yes, you can scale out that as well. Um, slow publishing refresh. The publishing refresh, actually getting the data from the server, pretty fast. Getting it, the package published on the client, not so fast. A bit slower. And connection groups in a native infrastructure are their own entity. This kind of tricked me. If you remove a package, basically that doesn't do any, or if you unpublish a package, remove any access entity assigned to it, it's still available if it's part of a connection group. So connection groups are their own entity with whatever assignment, whatever state they're on. So to re remove a package, you have to delete it from the uh, database, essentially. Whatever publishing state, whatever AD assignment you set on the package, doesn't matter. It's part of the connection group. SCCM 2012, Service Pack 1, native support for both AppV 5 or 6, and well, you can probably go a bit backwards, and AppV 5. There's no configuration on the client specific to SCCM. Just deploy it, good to go. Um, fully support shared content store, meaning you don't have to do any configuration when you deploy applications to Senap or VDI desktops. Um, there's an oddity in the console though. Inserting the application into the application model, pretty straightforward. Just follow the wizard. Connection groups are named virtual environments. I have no idea why they named it that. It's just why. There's no purpose for it. But you manage connection groups with virtual environments. I think I have on the next slide something else. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, supports and or, meaning if I have these packages, create the VE or statements. Or do not create the VE virtual environment until I have all these specific packages. So I can dynamically create my connection groups on the client and SCCM will keep track of if you only have these, yes, I should create it. Or no, you have this set, create this connection group. So it's very dynamic in how you assign it to users and you can build quite complex uh, rules for how this should be set up. The user interface is pretty simple. So a bit of testing first with simple statements, then I would go forward with the more complex stuff. Um, sequencing, of course, an application package we have. We want a long lifespan. We want a multi-platform support. That's why we traditionally looked at AppB, right? We want to move from whatever platform to whatever new platform we've got this year in our hands. 
<clears throat> App View 5 introduced the virtual extensions. We have config files to improve the lifespan of that package because we don't have to crack it open to do quite a lot of stuff. We have improved stability. Unfortunately, no Windows XP. That's a dead platform, right? <laughs> what are you laughing about? And there's no size limit as well. So we can now have packages grow as large as we want. I generated 10 gigs just for the heck of it. Didn't do much, but no problem. Sequencing environment as previously. Uh, of course, we need suffice performance. Of course, you need suffice hard drive space, meaning, yes, you need to have enough space on your hard drive to install the application and probably duplicate that amount of space because we're going to compress it into a zip file. Windows 7 SP1 and higher, no RDS enabled. That's the way I would go. Um, sequencing environment should match your target platform. That is actually more important now than previously. No, it's not such a good idea anymore to package a 32-bit application on a 32-bit platform or uh, a 32-bit application on a 32-bit platform for a 64-bit platform. I'll show that in a minute. Uh, use snapshots makes life faster. .NET Framework, PowerShell 3.0, requirements of the sequencer. So good idea to have them both on the sequencer, required for the client as well. All .NET Frameworks, don't skip one, include them all. All Visual C++, I can tell you it's more than 22 nowadays. So if you have less than that, you're doing it wrong. All F-sharp, all J-sharp redistributables, no antivirus. I'm saying no user account control, but I think the other MVPs don't agree with me. I think Aaron Parker made a remark regarding that one, so use your practice. If you have it enabled on the client, I would say have it enabled on the sequence as well. I always disable it. Um, <laughs> next question, domain joined or not? Should our sequencing environment be domain joined? Well, if your application require, requires it, yes, of course it should. If you don't have an opinion, go work group. Yes, it will make life easier if your sequencer is joined to domain because you can access file shares without typing in uh, your credentials. That's a good reason, right? I'm sold. Documentation. I think Tim Mangan started all his uh, Gridmaster training, which is based on the AppV4.6 and now AppV5 material. He said, the last package you'll ever have to make is with AppV4. That's not entirely true, because now you might actually have to repackage the stuff again. So, always document it. You always need a paper saying, how did I install this application? What do I need to know about it? What does it connect to? Not because you might not remember it because you might not be there. Someone else might have to redo it in the future. AppV5 is a new format. There's conversion to it. It's only PowerShell commandlets. There's a guy I feel really terrible for right now because he provided an extremely nice GUI of using the PowerShell commandlets. So you can click a click and you convert the package. It takes a bit of time. I did a conversion of one gigabyte packages and that was like a five minute peg CPU process. Not so fun, but it gets the job done. Obviously, this is the format right now. In the future, what will we have? I don't know. So document the entire process. We don't know what new format we will have to adopt. MSI was great 10 years ago, right? Now they're moving back to executables wrapping the MSI, even Microsoft. <clears throat> Sequencing setup. Obviously, you should know your application. 100% of sequencing failures start out with you don't know your application. Meaning you don't do your job and the person paying for it is most likely not happy with you. If you want to troubleshoot it, you can create a package and deploy it to the client. If it doesn't work, go back to the reset the sequencer, go back to the sequencer and you can expand the files, meaning you will lay down everything you have in the package natively onto the operating system and you will see it exactly how it should behave. And then you can see, does it work on my sequencer natively installed? If it doesn't, most likely something is not in the package, right? Simple trick. There is something new called PVAD. Primary Virtual Application Directory. Previously we had the Q drive. We do not have a Q drive. Instead we have a PVAD. That is a horrible folder because I have a hard time explaining it, but I have picked up a few differences. One, it's more kind of like the QDRIVE. <laughs> Essentially, it's the primary root folder of your package. You can, uh, it should be 
the folder that you install the application to. That's the best practice. That's the folder you should specify. There's no hint to it. You can browse to any folder. I have been testing just typing C, random folder name, and selecting that. Obviously, I'm not installing my application into C, random folder name. I'll let the installer use whatever default option it had. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Just like the Q drive, we had two options. Install into the PVAD or don't install into the PVAD. There is no improvement there. It's just different name, different concept. Um, sequencing setup, no auto update. Obviously, install, don't use install on first use. Configure your application. The user shouldn't have to. Leverage, prepare for streaming. Now you have three options. You can have nothing show up. Uh, meaning, if I get the package and I click the, the icon, the user does, I click the icon on the client. If you have not prepared it for streaming, if there's nothing set up, the initial download would start picking stuff off, out of the package and getting as it needs. If you prepare it for streaming, it will download something initially which requires, is required to start the application, or you can force the entire package to be completely downloaded before the user starts the application. So in a streaming scenario, it's very important to determine how your users want to interact with it. If you ensure that it's fully cached up, of course you can force everything into the cache, right? That's good. Initial startup might be slow. Depends on your environment. You can define what target operating systems you want to deploy the package to. Microsoft says make sure you only define a target system that it's allowed to install on a Windows 7 64-bit. I say don't define anything. Test it in the future. <clears throat> Limitations, pretty much, kind of, sort of, the same we had previously. No boot time services, avoid them. No drivers, what do you do instead? The answer is up there. Extract it and deploy it natively. OS components, Internet Explorer and .NET Framework should be deployed natively and cannot be sequenced. Com shouldn't really, really be a limitation. Office has been using it for quite a while and Apart from the virtual extension limitations with which we had in previous versions, we're getting now more integration, but COM hasn't really been an issue for Office, for example. <clears throat> and now we're getting back to why it's a bad idea to sequence a 32-bit application on a 32-bit platform if you're going to deploy it to a 64-bit system. Just like it says up there. <clears throat> Uh, you cannot package a 32-bit application on a 64-bit platform and deploy it to a 32-bit uh, platform. Kind of obvious, you actually could previously. So you could do that previously. Now you cannot, period. A 32-bit app on a 32-bit OS can execute on a 64-bit endpoint, but you will not get the new and enhanced extensions. You will get shortcut and file type associ associations, and there it stops. So the SPAD, what's that name? The SPAD, the, the, the uh, enhanced, uh, what do you call it? The enhanced autoplay, um, all that stuff, the app path, all gone basically. So you're back to a 4.6 state. So I would really sequence on the target platform if you want to utilize those. Uh, yep? That means when I have to use this packaging, both 32 and six, uh, 46 uh, uh, bit environment, I have to have two packages. If you have virtual extensions you want to support, yes. Mm -hmm. That was a fairly short answer. 64-bit applications can obviously only execute on 64-bit uh, 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 operating systems, so self-explanatory. <clears throat> Sequence an application is install the application. That's not too hard. Should you start the application during the sequencing process? Java, I rarely do it. Why? Because Java has a bad habit of hard coding file paths into files, which the AppV sequencer cannot neutralize and make plat or uh, what do you call it? computer agnostic. They cannot make them independent of your sequencer. If it crashes during your testing, no, do not start it during sequencing. Quite often, though, yes, you will start the application during the packaging or the sequencing process, and therefore get the benefit of actually pre-configuring the application to the preset or predefined need that the user wants. Um, um, services can still be captured. They have limited use because they're running in a virtual environment, so capturing your antivirus service as a virtual service is of course a horrible idea. I have actually done so and they do start, it just takes a lot of performance. You cannot, uh, I usually recommend people to remove services unless you know why you need them. 
and quite a few people don't. So quite often it's just remove it. Because before you start the application, obviously the service has to be started. Startup performance for the application goes down. Edit virtual extensions. Virtual extensions cannot be edited through the sequencers. You, if you want to do any post-sequencing editing, you have to use the configuration files. Therefore, it's very important to learn those XML files initially and perhaps use the editor provided by Virtual Engine. <clears throat> Update the application. You have a couple of different ways of doing it. You can create a brand new package, right? There you, lose, you have the loss of user settings, but you can run the application side by side or the package side by side with the old package. New version, you maintain user settings, but um, you actually require an admin to deploy it. I think they fixed that in Service Pack 1, so that's not entirely true. Uh, it's quite easy. Again, you can do differential streaming. Uh, it could look on the file system that you're leveraging a lot of file space if you're not using shared content store, but it's actually just pointers to the files. So you're building up two similar structures where the old one is just lagging behind, and it looks like it's consuming space, but it's not really. If you want to do minor updates, leverage your configuration files, they're great. Especially with the SCCM and the native infrastructure, it's really easy. With the, uh, if you're doing standalone, you got to do it through PowerShell, no other way. Um, migration, package converter. You have a test commandlet and you have a, a conversion commandlet. You can batch through a directory, meaning go to every folder, find every package, convert every package. Obviously, if you want to, you can test it. There's a couple of limitations to this process. OSD content, meaning any registry key, any script you have in the OSD file of the previous app before 6 package, will not tag along. It's gone. Hard-coded paths within a file will not be migrated because the app sequencer during any sequencing process cannot look into that file, especially if it's binary. And 64-bit apps has to be converted on a 64-bit operating system. Self-explanatory, I hope. Are you following along or is falling asleep? You're dead to me. <laughs> um, package accelerators. It's a way for Microsoft to provide easy guidance to produce packages. They're not easy to use though. Um, they're provided through the TechNet gallery, so yes, you can download them fairly easy. It does require that you have access to source media and the package accelerator. You put them together in the sequencer and out you get a package. Big question is, what happens if something breaks? You fix it. So why not create the package on your own in your environment so you know what happened? And of course, you can document it because now you're in charge and you know what has to be done if something's not working, hopefully. Um, troubleshooting, uh, we're moving to event logs, uh, there are error codes there, I think the 10 last digits of that error code is the actual error. In the sequencing process we have a file called report.xml, it will be presented to you during the sequencing process, so you get a pre-report, meaning hey you have the antivirus running, that's a bad idea. And post packaging, meaning hey we excluded files from this package, you might need to look into that, or a driver was detected. So you get a, a, a process update during the entire sequencing process of things that might be worth looking into or knowing about. In the end though, know your application. If you don't know the application, you shouldn't sequence it. Let's start with that one. If you don't know your application, you should go to stealthpuppy.com because Aaron Parker in the UK is a great guy and I think he asked me, he told me at one point that he was going to start a list of all the sequencing recipes. Obviously it's mostly 4.6 but AppV5 is coming. So I think at one point we got 200, now we're up to 400. In the end, this is because you didn't do your, do your homework, to be honest. But I go there all the time, so I never do my homework. I have a couple of minutes left on the clock. This is my contact information. I was so glad when Alex remarked that I should have my contact information at the end, that I actually had it. Uh, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it looks like it's still not possible to sequence an application like a Citrix Siva. Uh, why do you device driver and so on. Uh, yes, the USB driver would be out of scope, but the rest of it, sure, knock yourself out. I don't know, actually, that depends on. If you can do, I, I know that you, the USB driver is that in a separate. Yeah, but those can be extracted out in separate MSIs and you can deploy them independently, right? 
So essentially, you would do a virtual package which would contain the actual application, then you would do a MSI package, and considering the app model in 2012, that's pretty easy to deploy, right? Yeah, but then there is the Exactly. Why not just install it? You're making more work. Again, don't virtualize the application if you're not getting a benefit. Any other questions? Too fast, too slow. Should I repeat? One question. Again. There is absolutely no problem of using a native driver. That's why I recommend it extract and deploy. So usually I have a customer, they just create a file share and have that as a path. This is, this is where all the drivers are. Or you deploy an MSI package in the Citrix case. You can deploy, if you have an MSI package, deploy that one. Quite often, um, you can do a dirty packaging process, meaning, yes, you just install the application and the driver, the file of the driver will be part of the package. But since it's virtual, when you deploy it to the client, it's pretty useless. So if you deploy the driver natively to the client, the application can quite often leverage that without any hindrance. You have full access to the operating system. What you might do, though, is look into if you have a conflict of what's in the package, meaning does it have to look at a registry key, which is virtual, where you have a different value when it's native. So you might have to do cleanup to have full interaction, but you can look everywhere. Pretty good. I have three minutes on the clock now, roughly, so I could like do a demo, but it feels like a bit of short time. Okay, I'll just go for the clap then. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm.